Hello, what is up everybody? Welcome back to this series where this time I'll be walking you through my process on how I take a procedural animation from concept to reality. Uh, the goal we're going to be working towards today is this kind of wavy transition effect that's taken from the Dead Mouse Masterclass. It was sent to me a little while ago by a viewer, and I thought it'd be a fun project to work on as well as a simple starting off point for this series. It wasn't quite as easy as I thought it was going to be, but it still should be pretty easy to follow along. Now, this is going to be the standard tutorial I usually make. Instead of going over every single button press, I am going to be covering more of the broader strokes of the project. I'm also going to be going over more of my own inner thought process on how I think and how I approach the problem myself. Now, if you remember back to last video, you'll remember our three steps. And instead of applying those three steps to the entire problem, what I'm instead going to do is I'm going to break it up into smaller chunks and apply the three steps to each of those smaller chunks. For example, the first step is to set a goal. So our first goal of this project should be to get a basic representation of this effect onto our screen. So I'm thinking just a few basic waves, maybe we can control the amount of waves, something like that. Um, it's basically going to be our metaphorical equivalent to a ball of clay, something that we can stick to the ground and stick everything else to. But now that we have our goal, we can officially cross off step number one. Moving on to step two, we need to figure out some things we already know that could help us out. Now, the first thing that my mind jumps to when looking at this example is sine waves. If you remember from the last video, sine is a function that generates pretty nice looking waves. Here, a basic understanding of functions is going to come in handy. Functions consist of an input and an output, which is represented by the function as a whole. Generally, adding and subtracting from the input will shift the function left and right, and multiplying and dividing the input will change its width. On the other hand, adding and subtracting from the output will change its vertical position, and multiplying will change its height. Looking at sine using Desmos, we can start playing around with it and seeing how we can manipulate the function into doing what we want. By manipulating the input, we can change its frequency, by adding to the input, we can move the wave left and right. And finally, we can multiply the function by a value to increase its height or amplitude. In Desmos, we can also add some variables and sliders to get a better feel for manipulating the function. And with that, we have officially crossed off step number two and can move on to step three. I'm already starting to get a basic idea in my head about what tools I want to use to do this. I know that animation nodes can generate points, and I know that each point has an x, y, and z coordinate which can be manipulated using math. With this, I should be able to easily create a sine wave. I can then use the points to generate a mesh, or a spline, or whatever I want to do later in order to create the strands we see in the video. At this point, I'm also starting to think how it should be pretty simple to hook up an audio input to any of these values to shift them around, but that's for later. Still, it's important to at least have a vague understanding of where we're going. In animation nodes, I added a line mesh generator to generate some points for us to work with. We can use these points later to generate splines, but right now I'm just using 3D Viewer to see what we have. In order to actually get the sine wave shape, we need to set the z height to the sine of the x value. So the formula would look like z equals the sine of x. To actually use this formula in animation nodes, I'm going to add both a separate and combine vector nodes connect those up like usual, but instead of connecting the z value, I'm going to instead add a float math node, set it to sine, and use the x value as the input, while setting the z value as the output. We can even go a bit further by adding an add math node between the x and the sine. We can then add the current frame and cause it to move when the animation is played. Now, at this point, I ran into a problem. In my head, I just kind of assumed I would somehow use the object instancer to duplicate the wave, but unfortunately, we can't instance lists of vectors, so that makes the object instancer useless in this case. I then figured I would try a loop where each iteration of the loop generated its own wave. I started by creating a new loop with a vector list output and moving everything we already made inside the loop. We can then call the loop from elsewhere, but you'll notice it doesn't look any different than before, and that's because all four waves are currently on top of each other, so we need a way to tell animation nodes to offset each iteration of the loop by a certain amount. Thankfully, we have this nice little index value that provides us the current iteration of the loop. Now, if you remember, each iteration of the loop is its own wave, so if we set the y value of the points to whatever number it's on, it should give us the result we want. And bingo, that's exactly what happened. This is pretty much the goal I was trying to achieve, so we can now cross off step number three and move on to our next chunk.
Now, looking back at our example, we can see that the closer the waves are to the camera, the smaller they are, and the further the waves are from the camera, the bigger they are. Starting back at step number one, my goal is now to achieve this scaling effect. As for step number two, all we currently have to work with is the index of the loop and the location of the points. However, because we use the index of the loop to set the Y position of the points in the last step, the index and the Y position are basically the same. We also know from playing with the sine function earlier that in order to adjust the height, we need to multiply the output of the function by some value. We now figured out what we already know, so we can safely cross off step number two. Focusing on step number three now, we need to figure out how to use the Y value to change the height. This is pretty easy, as all we have to do is multiply the sine of X by the Y position. What makes it even easier is we don't even need to get the Y value. We already use the index as the Y value, so we can just plug that directly into the multiply node. Now, after doing that, we don't have a ton of control over the minimum and maximum heights, so let's fix that by adding in a map range node. We now have some values we need to fill. We know the minimum input will always be zero because that's where loops start. They always start at zero. And the input max can be taken from the iterations value, which is the maximum amount of iterations for the loop. Now, all we need to do is adjust the values to something that seems about right. And we can check off step number three. We can also see from the clip that there's a certain amount of randomness to the height of each of the waves. Adding a small random value to the height of each of the waves should do the trick. So I'm going to take a random number generator and add it to the output of the map range node, which is currently controlling our height. We need to connect the seed value to our index so that we get a new random number for each of our waves. And once we add it to the original height value, we should get what we're after. And then I played around with the values for a while until I got something which looked how I wanted it to. Now, I think my next goal is going to be getting the waves moving horizontally how they should. In the clip, the waves are all moving the same direction, but at different speeds, maybe also with a little bit of randomness. We already know the current frame, position of the points, and that we are using the sine function to generate these points, which we can modify. So I think we can check off step number two as well. Now the solvable becomes how to get the waves to actually move. Going back to our Desmos example again, we know that adding to the input will allow us to shift the waves horizontally. With this input, it should be easy to set it up so that a slightly larger value gets added to the sine wave depending on how far away it is from the camera. This finishes up step number three. Now to actually do this. Currently, we're already adding the frame to the x value for the sine input, so we have two options. First, let's slow it down by using a multiply node so we can at least see what we're doing. Our first option is to just add the frame and the index together. This looks good, but doing this will only give us a constant offset which never changes and it looks kind of boring because even though the further one is being shifted more, it's only being shifted once and then just moving at the same speed as all the other waves. A more interesting solution might be to actually multiply them so that the further away the strand is, the faster it moves. We can also use the map range node, hook the value up to the index and the input max up to the iteration, just like we did before, in order to allow us fine control over the minimum and maximum speeds of the strands. We can also delete the multiplication node we added as we don't need it anymore and focus on tweaking the values of our map range node. The last thing it looks like we need to add is the vertical motion. It looks like each strand is going randomly up or down, so just like we did before, I know we're going to need to add some kind of random value to each of the Y positions. Also, because it's up or down, we know that the random number must be between a negative value and a positive value, as adding a negative value is the same as subtraction. Going back to Desmos just to recap, adding a value to the end of the sine function will allow us to move the entire wave up and down. Before I actually add the audio to drive the animation, I'm going to add the parts that the audio will connect to, so that all we have to do later is bake and plug it in. Let's add a math node at the end of our chain, right before the combined vector node. Now, we need to drop in our random number generator, set it to generate a number between negative 1 and 1, and hook it up to the seed of the index. Finally, to control it, we need to use a multiplication node. Drop that between the random number and the addition, and you'll notice that if we set it to 0, it goes back to normal, but if we increase the multiplication value, it'll increase the amount that the strands are displaced. This is the socket that the audio input will be plugged into. Next, I'm going to add in the bake audio just like I did in the audio visualizer tutorial and load up my track. Then I'm going to bake the average, 
and I'm going to search for Evaluate Sound Node and plug it into our Open Math input from earlier. That looks like it's throwing around the strands a bit too much, so I think I'm going to add in another Multiply node just to allow me to control this better. In the last few steps, we need to turn the points into splines and add those little water droplet effects like we see in the video. This was a little bit harder than I originally thought. My original plan was to just generate a spline from the points and I thought animation nodes would automatically generate multiple separate splines because I was plugging in multiple lists. Instead, it just kind of made one big connected spline. I didn't actually know why this was happening at first, but with a little bit of thinking, I was left with two possibilities. Either the multiple lists of points being generated in the loops was being combined into one big list at some point, or the curve object output node was trying to connect all the input splines into one. This is where animation nodes debugging tools came in handy. In the main body of our program, I can add a viewer node to each of the outputs and count the outputs. The outputs should be multiple lists coming out of the loop and then multiple splines being generated from the spline from points node. If both of these are working as expected, then we know it's the object output node that's causing our problem. I added the viewer nodes and realized that even though the loop text changed and told me that I was outputting vector lists, it actually just combined all the lists into one. Thankfully, the solution was pretty simple as instead of generating the splines outside of the loop, all I have to do to fix this is to generate the splines inside the loop and tell the loop to output lists of splines instead of lists of vectors. As you can see, this worked exactly how I wanted it to. The last thing we need to do is create the visual eye candy effects. The effects look pretty similar to an effect I did before on a personal project of water drops on a spider web, so I'm just going to do the same easy process here. First, I want to lower the bevel depth of these splines so that they are very thin. Next, I'm going to add a simple material to the curve object, which is just a mix between an emissive and transparent shader. I'm also going to make it orange because why not? Next, I'm going to create the small water droplets by adding an icosphere with a similar material but much brighter. Then I'm going to go back to our loop, add a vector list generator output, and hook that up to our vector list. I'm going to use these to instance our water drops. Like in my other videos, we are going to instance the icosphere by adding in an object instancer and eye dropping in our icosphere. Then I'm going to plug the vector list into the instances socket, which will automatically get the length. Then I'm going to hook that up to the transform output. And finally, I'm going to create a random scale by enabling the X, Y, and Z scale output, adding a random number and enable the list output and hooking the get length node up to the count socket. Finally, I'm going to add a random vector and hook that up, adjusting the size until it looks good. To get rid of those annoying blue lines, tap N on the keyboard to bring up properties and under display, disable relationship lines. Finally, the last things we need to do are to set the environment to black, add a camera and hit control zero to set it to view. And then in the camera settings, I'm going to quickly set the focal length a bit higher to something like 60. Adjust our position a bit, enable limits, adjust the focal distance, and set the size of the aperture to something like 0.15 to get a good depth of field. And then I'm gonna tweak the distance until it feels right. And that's it, we can sit back and enjoy our hard work. The project file will be available for download as is, as well as a copy of it that is a bit more organized and commented. I highly recommend only looking at those files after attempting it first yourself. With a little bit of math and a little bit of problem solving, we've managed to create something that's pretty visually interesting. And next time we're gonna be using a lot of the same tools to create some stunning 3D shapes. Anyways, that about wraps up this video. By now you all know the drill. If you like this video and like to help me make more, be sure to support me on Patreon at the link at the end of this video or in the description down below. Also be sure to like and subscribe. If you didn't like this video, need help, or just looking for some friendly conversation, make sure to leave a comment. And as always, I will see you next time. I'm not sure